Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to take a look at the U.S. cannabis market for June 2020, according to the Brightfield Group. To help us do that is Katrina Glogowski, angel investor and attorney. Katrina, thanks for being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. All right. So the total addressable market is <laughs> a billion dollars. So they're expecting 18 billion by the end of this year. That's a 24% increase over last year. So adult use will account for 60% of sales and the market is projected to surpass the 43 billion by 2025, representing a compounded annual growth rate of 20%. So this is driven primarily by adult use that will comprise 75% of the market by 2025 and will continue to grow significantly due to market openings, expansion, and increase in consumer interest. No surprise there, Josh. Nope. And, you know, with different cannabinoids, it could also increase with children or infants or who knows what's going to happen and what people are doing. Scientists are already talking about using this for the virus. So um, that could be interesting. We'll see what happens. I, uh, I think we have yet to determine the full spectrum of uh, cannabis in the commercial market. That's true. So looking at some growth drivers by region from Northeast to Midwest, the Northeast is going to have a lot more to grow. Obviously, the West started. So growth drivers through 2025, Midwest and Northeast regions are going to see new openings and be responsible for the greatest portion of that market share growth. Um, I would say maybe... Uh, Massachusetts is huge. They've got about five universities there. So I would take a look at that. Katrina, what's your crystal ball for the Northeast? I think Northeast is going to uh, have a hockey stick growth and then level out just like all the other legalized states. Uh, I don't see why the Northeast, the Midwest, the South would be any different than the other states that have legalized. Mm hmm. Yeah, even your home state of uh, New York, there are people that are taking off because of the virus going to Florida and other places, but still, I think we'll see solid sales like we've seen anywhere else. So New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, all expected to legalize adult use cannabis over the forecast period. The West will see slower growth than other regions. Uh, the West is going to contribute $6 billion to the industry from 2020 to 2025 as California continues to mature. California is huge. They are going to hit like $3 billion in sales or over that, almost maybe three and a half billion. So we're all celebrating billion dollars in sales between Colorado and Washington, but California right. is tripling that. Which makes sense. They have a huge population. They're hoping that uh, Arizona and New Mexico come online and add to those sales. Illinois, uh, I think they're posting between 30 and 40 million in monthly sales in Illinois. So they're taking off, doing pretty well. Uh, slower growth is expected from the South due to the region's generally restrictive attitudes towards cannabis, uh, with the notable exception of Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma is going to look a lot like Oregon with all of the licenses that they have. So uh, I would look for a huge glut in the market in Oklahoma and prices plummeting. Hopefully there's no backdoor diversion to the illicit market like we saw in, um, in Oregon, allegedly. <laughs> uh yeah i wasn't on the ground in oregon so i can't say what happened to all their uh cannabis but oregon was very progressive and the state of oregon legalized exportation mm -hmm. uh you can't actually export anything because it's a violation of federal law but again they're they're trying to address the glut in the market with this export uh and they're pushing for it they they want to uh, allow their uh cannabis growers access to additional markets um and josh you and i have spoke about this before you know you don't grow bananas in saskatchewan canada uh because it's too expensive and you're going to see consolidation as the rest of the states fall to legalization it's just going to become how much it costs to grow. Uh, and you're going to see that. Uh, so a matter of time. Yeah. You also don't see 1400 tomato farms in, in every single state either. So <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So looking at some market trends that not all markets are created equally. So there's going to be regulation strain on retail. So it says that, uh, with recent marketing openings, the cannabis industry has experienced rapidly unfolding and expanding market operating 
with a wide range of models. Closer look at several current models, including recent open adult use markets in Michigan and Illinois sheds light on the challenges with retail and product access that often constrain growth and limit full market maturity. And I would look at Washington for that because I don't think we've been more constrained where you can't have a vertically integrated company where the producer and processor is separate from the retailer. You can't have outside investment. They limited advertising on billboards and all other places. Uh, Washington is a tough, tough market. I think Washington being first out of the gate, uh, people forget that Washington and Colorado uh, came up at the exact same time. Uh, Colorado came online first, uh, giving them the trophy of uh, being first to market, but um, the, the, re the legislation came up at the exact same time. And when Washington drafted their legislation, they didn't want the federal government to to interfere and so they made it as hard as possible to uh, have a cannabis business and the legacy effects of of those regulations are continuing josh now almost 10 years later mm -hmm. yeah it could be interesting to see what happens if we have national legalization and all of these state rules kind of go to the wayside not really sure what's going to happen. <clears throat> what I do know what's already happened is medical dispensaries um, have basically kind of just been taken over by retail stores. So as soon as a, a store goes to the uh, regulated marketplace, those medical stores are pretty much pushed out um, for whatever reason. Well, this doesn't surprise me either. Uh, when was the last time you saw a mom and pop pharmacy as opposed to a Rite Aid and a Walgreens and a and a Bartels, uh, you know, where there's money to be made, people are gonna come in, <clears throat> consolidate and automate and, you know, just general business activities. And medical marijuana uh, suffered mightily in the state of Washington, as we know, uh, and it just didn't survive. Yeah, when was the last time you saw, you know, an, a big ag company go public? You know, and yet we see all of these cannabis companies doing the same thing. So still has some uh, maturity to go. Oh, yeah. All right. So according to Brightfield, they're looking at uh, the impacts of this virus with consolidation, impacting sales and changing the industry at large. Um, definitely seeing some constraints from capital. Um, not as much investment right now, not as many deals, and a lot more consolidation. So I think as companies um, that aren't able to kind of network and work together are looking for uh, strategic partners or buyouts, or they're just kind of going out of business with the, the total reduction in sales, uh, even with um, cannabis retail shops being essential business, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of these companies are going to be able to uh, remain open. Well, Again, that's also an indication of the normalization of the cannabis industry, right? Uh, a, a certain percentage of bars and restaurants close every year, uh, and, and that's expected in the industry. Uh, and consolidation occurs. Uh, we've talked about consolidation before, uh, especially in Washington, where it's very difficult with the lack of in, a vertical integration uh, you got to get the cost of goods sold down. And if you only have a tier one license and you're only producing, you know, maybe, maybe a thousand pounds a year, uh, it makes it really hard to compete. Uh, and you got to get it in the stores. You got to get your, the consumer to buy your brand. Um, it, it's difficult. Uh, and people forget that uh, it, it, <laughs> the, the, the green rush days of easy money uh, uh, are, are rapidly uh, evaporating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are going to be reducing the number of SKUs and just kind of focusing on core essential uh, products that they want to sell. So I'm already kind of hearing that from some of the ancillary businesses out there um, reducing what they're selling. Uh, so as soon as Washington can figure out how to do delivery and implement that law, I think that could change with, you know, better um, e-commerce sites, um, better ways to buy it. But looking at um, the percentage on planning to use cannabis more often, 
So 12% just use it a few times a month versus using a few times a day at 44%. Um, definitely looks like more people are accepting it, more people are using it for whatever reason, I'm sure, both pain and pleasure. Well, also you're stuck at home. Right. And so edibles specifically and infused or, or non infused. I mean, you could see on this graph here that baking has increased substantially. So baking mixes, sales of those have gone up 106%. And so um, people are definitely wanting edibles. So with cannabis, we could see people staying at home, maybe wanting an edible instead of topicals. So there is a reduction in sales and tinctures and topicals, an increase in edibles. And then even the regular grocery stores, you can see here, people are just buying comfort foods, pizza, pie. <laughs> well, this fits, uh, you know, uh, if, if anything, it's telling, of, telling what the Americans eating habits are. Uh, just because the bakery on the corner is closed doesn't mean you don't want a piece of cake anymore. Uh, you, you still want a piece of cake, and if you want a piece of cake, you got to make it. Uh, it. So it makes sense. Uh, I, I think that that same statistic would apply for uh, hamburger meat or vegetables, uh, just because uh, options are, are significantly incre uh, decreased uh, as a result of the current situation. And uh, I, I hear uh, anecdotes uh, <laughs> of individuals uh, who, who greatly love their families, uh, but uh, did not ever anticipate spending, you know, four or five consecutive months uh, with their family. Uh, and they're looking for um, uh, a little bit of relief and uh, we all know that cannabis is better for the majority, not all, but the majority of, of the population than alcohol. Um, and getting back to your edibles comment, Josh, uh, you know, when you light up a joint, it stinks. So hide it, hide it somewhere else. Uh, and I think that it, the uh, intrepid consumer uh, discovers it's not that hard to to make uh, brownies, uh, infused brownies, inf infused hot chocolates, these types of things to, to try and cover uh, the fact that they're consuming cannabis, uh, especially in front of children. Uh, you don't wanna be consuming cannabis in front of children, that, that's just not cool. So hide it, makes sense. So the top occasions for using cannabis, relaxing at home at 27%, before or after yoga or workout, 34%. Taking home or taking care of job duties at home, 36%. And then right before bed, 51%. So depending on the strain, I know that a good like a sativa uh, get you going, get your house clean right away. So make sure you get the right strain for the right occasion. Come up with what you're gonna do with uh, three kids under five uh, for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> for the uh, uh, like 129th straight day. <laughs> mm -hmm. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, if they can't go back to school in the fall and you're going to be stuck parenting, uh, yeah, you're going to need some more uh, cannabinoids. And maybe you're not into THC. Maybe you don't know anything about CBD. But uh, there's some new players so Brightfield highlights CBN, CBG, and THCA as other minor cannabinoids that are hitting the shelves as additives to the innovative cannabis products. Though these cannabinoids have been known about for years, they're just starting to hit the store shelves as companies look for novel products to bring to market. Uh, and it's not just that uh, people have known about it for years, but the Farm Bill in 2018, is that when it was signed in the fall? Correct. Allowing for the sale of hemp and then now other cannabinoids. But Washington State doesn't allow you to sell anything other than CBD. So we're stuck until the feds do something. So hopefully that uh, works its way out. Well, Josh, as you know, there are many, 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 many different cannabinoids. And uh, the nascent industry, uh, remember, uh, cannabis has only been legal in a variety of states for a short period of time. 
And there's lots of anecdotal evidence related to these various cannabinoid compounds. And a discerning consumer can say, I like CBN. And number one, that requires they know what CBN is. Number two, it requires that they have access to a supply of CBN so that they know the effect uh, uh, that they're seeking from CBN. And then, of course, ultimately, you need a market for CBN. Uh, but you're going to see more and more and more of this as science enters the cannabis market. So I don't think CBN or CBG uh, occur naturally. I think it's in the, um, the process uh, through um, extraction and CBN also occurs with light degradation, but um, not generally naturally like a CBD or THC, but some other products out here that you can see uh, gummies that have CBN that are targeting towards a good night's sleep. So you might have a sativa, but if it's really old and it's light degradation, they'll turn into CBN. And so they'll give you this kind of in the couch, sleepy um, melanin effect. Melatonin. Yeah, kind of sleepy, tranquil. Well, I think that uh, history will show that this legalization of cannabis discovers all sorts of interesting compounds that deserve further scientific study. Uh, the, the, the range of cannabinoids is huge, and I really encourage science to come up and say, this can help with this, this can help with that. Uh, and of course, the perennial question in the cannabis market is dosage. Uh, and we need science to, to establish those parameters before the general acceptance of these minor cannabinoids, Josh. Yeah, I think there's over 480 known cannabinoids and with the entourage effect, um, coupling that with THC, you'll have more uptake and bioavailability and all that good stuff. Uh, but to conclude this cannabis report, uh, looks like new consumers across four states are going to gain access. That's Illinois. And then medical patients in Utah and Virginia and Missouri. So legalization is going to gain momentum. Hopefully, we'll see some other people jump on the bandwagon because definitely if uh, you have state budget deficits, best way to to get the green legalize that cannabis certainly and if that's what direction cbd goes in uh legalize it regulate it and tax it that might be the answer i i don't know yep and then lastly cannabis becoming more mainstream they're going to need to reach out to different segments of consumers with varied marketing and product offerings is key Josh, I've talked about this. The soccer mom does not want to spark up a joint or have a complicated dab rig with a blowtorch. The, the soccer mom wants something discreet, be it a palm-sized vape pen or an edible. But the soccer mom also does not want to be consuming an extra thousand calories a day eating a piece of chocolate. Uh, so the... the growth of the industry that really we are looking at is the normalization. And as an investor, I'm looking for innovations in that normalization process. Uh, I'm not so much interested in, in a pre-roll machine, bless your heart, Josh. Uh, I'm not so much because uh, I don't think the future of the industry is pre-roll joints. Um, the future of the industry is grandma who is trying to treat uh, a, a particular condition and the soccer mom that, um, that has to sit through a thousandth violin concert uh, of her three-year-old daughter uh, <laughs> that uh, may or may not be uh, pleasant. Uh, and, and so we, we need to look for the future of the industry and the future is in the cannabinoids and the soccer mom type products, Josh. I agree. As soon as it can become a consumer packaged good, CPG, uh, I would say consumer product good, but 
same thing, same concept. As soon as it can become normalized and on the shelves at the grocery store and you can see it and it's in the things you want um, as just an ingredient, as soon as it becomes normalized to the point where it's an ingredient like vitamin C and you have the same trust and faith in vitamin C that you will with other cannabinoids, that's at the point where it'll just kind of explode um, and have its uh, full potential. I think we're just going to wait and find out. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I want to thank my guest, Katrina Golgowski, angel investor and attorney in Seattle. Appreciate you being back on the podcast. Thanks, Josh. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. And check out these other videos that we've got.